China-U.S. relations take another hit after President Trump threatens to shut down TikTok. What's driving Washington's attacks on Beijing? Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu, and this is The Heat. Relations between the United States and China continue to take a hammering after tensions on issues like trade and the closing of consulates. The latest area of contention centers on the Chinese-owned video app TikTok. Last week, President Trump threatened to ban it from the United States, and he's given a mid-September deadline for its sale to a U.S. buyer. He's citing security concerns, but also wants the U.S. to profit financially from any deal. We want no security problems with China. It's got to be an American company. It's got to be American security. It's got to be owned here. We don't want to have any problems with security, et cetera. But we want, and we think we deserve to have a big percentage of that price coming to America, coming to the Treasury. But China has pushed back hard on the threat from President Trump, with a foreign ministry spokesperson denouncing the U.S. action. The U.S. suppression of the relevant company out of so-called national security holds no water at all. The relevant company carried out business activities in the U.S. in accordance with market principles and international rules and abided by U.S. laws and regulations. But the U.S. has imposed restrictions and suppressed them on unwarranted charges. This is complete political manipulation. Well, there is much to discuss, so let's get to our panel. Joining me from Beijing via Skype is Victor Ga. He is chair professor at Suchow University. Also with us via Skype from Washington, D.C. is Harlan Ullman. He is chairman of the Cologne Group and a senior advisor for the Atlantic Council. With us, too, from Beijing is Shindo Xu. He is a senior fellow with the Pangol Institution and host of CGTN's Dialogue Weekend. And from Washington, D.C., we are also joined by John Siddelides. He is a geopolitical strategist and principal at Trilogy Advisors. Welcome to all of you to the show. Uh, Victor, let me start with you. This is tough action by the United States, uh, forcing the owners of TikTok to sell uh, the app to find a buyer by mid-September or else, well, or else we don't know what. What do you make of it? Well, first of all, I think uh, this action by President Donald Trump and the U.S. government should be condemned and deplored. Why? Because it really is against all the principles that the United States has preached to the rest of the world for decades, if not for 100 years. Why? Because this is really anti-science. This is anti the real national security law. This is anti-American consumers' interest. And this is purely robbery or piracy. And I've called it cannibalism. This is really robbing something at gunpoint hosted by the United States government. And I think if this can be tolerated, anything can be called a national security interest. The wheat and the soybean sold by the American farmers can be called a national security risk. Pepsi or Coca-Cola could be called a national security interest. This will really be bring down international commerce to a stop. John, what do you make of it? Will it bring down international commerce to a stop? I mean, what do you make of the White House involvement in this? Well, I'd like to put this into a larger context, if I might, Anand, because it was in 2015 that the Chinese government declared its Made in China 2025 policy to achieve global dominance in a series of advanced breakthrough technologies. And the real problem here is the 2017 law that was passed in Beijing that requires every Chinese citizen, organization, and company to surrender to the Chinese government all data and intercepts the Chinese government requests or mandates. And so it's in that context that the data that TikTok is able to accumulate from U.S. users regarding consumer preferences, search engine activity, and facial recognition data, there's a great concern in the White House that that could be exploited or manipulated by the Chinese Communist Party, therefore the decision to potentially ban TikTok. Uh, could it uh, have an impact on international commerce, John? Yeah, look, uh, the, the great area of competition between the U.S. and China, as we move more deeply into what I call Cold War II, Anand, 
is information technology. I don't believe that we're going to have the typical type of consumer products, foodstuffs, and the like uh, that's going to be seriously affected here because in the end, China and the United States have large consumer markets that need to be satisfied. But in the specific domain of information technology, all bets are off right now. And I think the U.S. is looking to ensure that its companies are as protected as possible from China's national security law and really requesting reciprocity from China, which still bans Facebook, Google, YouTube and Twitter and other social media companies from operations in China. Victor, let me get a quick response for you on, from you on what John just said, that China bans uh, com American companies like Twitter and Google and Facebook. No, let me use Google as an example. I'm fully aware of that. Mm -hmm. Google came into China and agreed to abide by the Chinese censorship laws. And then eventually they changed their mind. They decided that they should not be subjected to the Chinese censorship law, which actually outlawed certain items that Google Chinese cannot run in China. And they moved their operations to Hong Kong. That's where they have stayed. And I think in China, you can still search Google English, but not Google Chinese because of these censorship concerns. Now, I would say in any country, any jurisdiction, there are short lists of concerns that are very unique to those geographies. Like in Germany or Austria, you cannot talk about denying genocide, for example. And I think these are the things that companies need to be sensitive about. In the TikTok, case. This is completely different. TikTok is an American incorporated company. It's run by an American CEO. Its servers stay in the United States. I think the company has done whatever it can under the existing law in the United States to abide by everything that's on the book in the United States. But the U.S. president or the U.S. government still threatened to kill TikTok the United States. Mm -hmm. disregarding the legitimate interests of hundreds of millions of the consumers in the United States. This All right. is treating the American people as a national security interest. Risk. Harlan Ullman, what do you make of uh, what's happened in the last few days? And of course, there's this other uh, comment that President Trump has made, asking for a cut of the sale for the U.S. Treasury. This is entirely absurd. The Chinese and even the Americans don't understand the political issue here. If Trump is stupid enough to cut off TikTok, there are 100 million kids who watch it in this country, and their parents are going to be furious or made furious by these kids who are going to say, the president caused me to lose this sort of thing. Look, if Microsoft can buy TikTok, this is a done deal, and the U.S. Treasury cannot take a slice that's against the law. So we ought to step back and be rational and use common sense. I don't think that there are national security issues involved. The issues right here are political. If Trump wants to close off TikTok, he's going to do himself huge damage in the elections. And the resolution is very simple. Let Microsoft buy it, and we can get along with trying to resolve the larger issues of this U.S.-Chinese potential Cold War, which is a disaster for both countries. And unless or until we can step back and deal with these things on a more rational basis, both China and the United States are going to be a lot worse off. Could it set a bad precedent, uh, Harlan, where any country, anywhere in the world, can say, look, our security interests are being compromised, therefore you cannot uh, operate in this country? Yeah, not really. I think that's an exaggeration. Look, both the United States and China are exaggerating this Cold War issue. A lot of the problem is doing done with Trump. Uh, precipitating this tariff war, which is an act of strategic negligence and stupidity. Right. We are, we are, we need to, we need to, we need to re retrench and we need to get back on more even footing. Neither China nor the United States can deal with these huge tensions that are detrimental to both countries and to world trade. And we need to get a more positive relationship. I don't think that's going to happen under President Trump. If Joe Biden is elected, will he be able to do things differently? I hope so, but we'll see what happens. Shindo Shu, as we have seen with the trade war, as well as the uh, closing of the consulates in uh, both countries, um, could this generate a counter move by China? I mean, what, will, what can China do? 
Well, uh, there's not much China can do, of course. You know, for me, I would uh, you know, uh, suggest the Chinese side uh, to exercise some restraint instead of uh, taking a tit for tat uh, uh, attitudes, you know, for whatever U.S. moves, and then you take revenge against that. Uh, after all, for one thing, uh, the Trump government, uh, uh, in a sense, is likely to be numbered because of the upcoming elections and also the dwindling numbers, uh, polling numbers of uh, President Trump. Uh, so uh, there's not much sense for China to play uh, you know, tit for tat uh, uh, retaliation against the U.S. moves. For example, uh, there's a report of the U.S. likely expelling of Chinese journalists uh, uh, very soon. Uh, so you know, should China also do the same to expel the U.S. journalists? I would suggest no. And because those journalists are bridges between the two countries, you know, they are messengers. They are reporting China to uh, the U.S. or reporting the U.S. to China. So they, they are playing a very important role. We should protect their rights and their, uh, their, their safety uh, in the both countries. So I think China should probably look a bit longer uh, beyond this Trump government, like beyond November the 3rd. John, according to Steve Bannon, who was a former senior advisor to uh, Donald Trump, he says that what he calls this an integrated war plan uh, that's determined to first confront and take down the Chinese Communist Party. And apparently the team behind this is uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, the FBI director, the national security advisor, and the attorney general, William Barr. Here's William Barr talking about it. Let's watch. The People's Republic of China is now engaged in an economic blitzkrieg, an aggressive, orchestrated, whole of government, indeed whole of society campaign to seize the commanding heights of the global economy and to surpass the United States as the world's preeminent technological superpower. John, what do you make of that? I mean, these two countries have what is one of the biggest trade relationships in the world. They do. And uh, that has been beneficial to the consumers of both countries. But what I think has happened really, Anand, is whereas China was undergoing the peaceful rise and bide your time strategy for a number of decades as its economy was growing, much of that came to, uh, uh, well, let's, let's say it moved in a different direction under Mr. Uh, Xi Jinping in 2012, who's taken on a far more assertive, far more aggressive, and some would say far more belligerent approach to China's place in Asia and around the world. And much of what we're seeing, not only in Washington, and we, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about President Trump, but there's a, a growing bipartisan consensus that China is to be viewed as a strategic adversary and a competitor and a very dangerous one in many aspects of the overall diplomatic relationship. So this is not just uh, Trump, it's not just Republicans, and we're also seeing this playing out in Europe and in Australia and in Japan and in India. And so what is happening in Beijing that's leading to the U.S. and all of these countries mm -hmm. with which China enjoys very strong trade and economic relationships yeah. to begin to turn against China and to take steps to begin to constrain China's very problematic behavior in Asia and around the world? Victor Gar, two points there. Uh, as John tells us, China is viewed as a strategic adversary, A, and B, it's also its attitude is one of belligerency, to which you would say what? Now, first of all, I would say the United States really cannot have the cake and eat it. For example, the United States has adopted a hostile policy against Huawei and has put tremendous amount of pressure on many countries in the world. By now, they cannot say, look, all these countries like Britain or other countries support our policy. No, they were forced into submission to the U.S. dominant policies which are in themselves wrong policy because yeah. eventually it will hurt the United States interest too. Now, the other thing, talking about competition between China and the United States, does Washington talk about China cannot continue to grow its economy? If that is what Washington expects, it will fail miserably because every country in the world mm -hmm. has the legitimate right of economic development. Yeah, Victor. And some countries will outgrow the other side. Right. And that's to be expected. There is a mega trend in China's yeah. growth. No one can stop it. In 10 years' time, China will be bigger than the United States. Okay, uh, Victor, the there. Don't fight against the mega trend. Right. There has been some pushback from China, uh, Victor. This was the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Han Chunying. This is what he had to say. 
out of their own selfish political interests. These people do not hesitate to hijack domestic political opinion, China-U.S. relations, international relations, even to the point where they have lost their minds and gone mad. Such short-sighted behavior of drinking poison to quench one's thirst is causing serious harm to the United States itself, as well as the world. So, Victor, does China see this latest confrontation over TikTok as part of a bigger strategy on the part of the United States to take on China, specifically the Chinese Communist Party? Absolutely. I've called what Washington has been doing over the past several years the Tony Harding syndrome. That is going out of its way to whack the kneecap of China in many, many ways. And this uh, TikTok episode is just one of these uh, kneecap whacking. It's just like Tonya Harding and her associate whacking the kneecap of Nancy Kerrigan. This is the wrong thing to do. Eventually, it destroys competition. It destroys the spirit of innovation. And, for example, for whatever legitimate national interest concerns that Washington may have in this TikTok situation, they can do it in a legitimate way rather than killing TikTok or forcing the outright sale of TikTok to an American company. This is the wrong thing. Okay. And I think this will really antagonize the feeling of the 1.4 billion Chinese people. So Washington does not know what they should expect in the coming years if they continue to adopt this attitude of hostility. It's not the world is against China. It's the United States arousing so much indignation in the world against itself. Yeah. Okay, let me, uh, let me bring in Harlan Ullman. Harlan, uh, the Chinese ambassador to the United States, he did an interview with CNN recently, uh, and he said that the United States needs to answer a major question when it comes to China policy. Let's listen to uh, what, else, what else he had to say. I think that the fundamental question for the United States is very simple. Is the United States ready or willing to live with another country with a very different culture, very different political and economic system, whether the United States is ready to live with it in peace and cooperate on so many and still growing global challenges. I think that this is a real choice. This is a fundamental choice people have to make. So, Harlan, what do you make of the question that the ambassador posed there? First, Bill Barr is right. China wants to become a dominant economic power. And so what? I think that's a good thing if we were smart enough to, have to deal with it. And John is right that you've got bipartisan support. I think, unfortunately, that's viewing China as the adversary and the enemy for the wrong reasons. Uh, during the Cold War, we exaggerated the power and the strength of the Soviet Union. Today, we neglect the constraints and problems that China has. We need to be tougher, uh, according to most Americans, regarding China. But we need to be smarter. And abandoning the Trans-Pacific Partnership and using allies as a way of engaging China, to me, was a strategic act of stupidity, even though Hillary Clinton was said she would have done that in any event. Look, we need to engage China. China is not a monolith. China is doing things that we find that are very, very difficult. Uh, it has a very, very predatory system of economics. Read K.F. Lee's book about AI superpower, uh, China and um, Silicon Valley, and those practices extend uh, overseas. We should understand that. But what we need to do is to engage China in a very sensible way. Right now, we are embarked, in my mind, on a collision. You've got the Titanic and the iceberg. And the big difference today is that China or the United States could be the Titanic or the iceberg. But if we both collide, both are going to sink. And so what we need to do is to have a series of discussions to work out the differences between us, because unless we do that, life is going to be worse for the Chinese and it's going to be worse for us. And we're neglecting an opportunity. If China is the greatest economy in the world, terrific. We can profit by it. Remember, China has between two and three trillion dollars invested in the United States. We often forget that. And where we have differences of views about China's militarizing islands and being more aggressive in terms of expanding its territorial interest, we need to work that out. But going to a Cold War 2.0 is not the way to do that. And having a tariff war, to me, just exacerbates these issues. So I'm afraid that both countries are embarked on the wrong course.
Shindoshi, what is your view on this? And uh, you know, as we just heard, this is bipartisan in the United States. It's not just President Trump and the Republicans that are bashing China. It's also the uh, Democrats. Uh, obviously, that is the case. I think there is a lot of uh, exaggeration of uh, the so-called China threat or rising China. What a big challenge from a rising uh, uh, China to the United States. Uh, for example, people are concerned with like whether China will replace the U.S. or become the dominant power. I think there is a, a lack of understanding or to some extent misunderstanding of uh, the Chinese policy. If you look at the China, the policy, for example, in the South China Sea, that remains unchanged. Even uh, there is a lot of you know, big fuss about the Chinese so-called expansion in the South China Sea. China try, uh, what China has tried to do is to maintain the status quo and uh, trying to create a peace and stability with neighboring countries, uh, in, in, in particular the Clements uh, in the South China Sea. That is the case. It remains unchanged. But uh, there's a lot of media coverage somehow sensationalizing the Chinese activity as uh, you know, presenting China to the, to the, uh, as a threat to this region. Uh, I think it's unfair reporting over there. And uh, for China, the priority is really about the domestic affairs, uh, taking care of the 1.3, 1.4 billion people, uh, creating more jobs for the people. For example, the, the biggest priority, number one priority for China is the creation of jobs for its own people. It's not about uh, replacing the U.S. China does not have that kind of ambition. China will not be replacing the U.S. Uh, you know, predominant position in, in, the, in the global community. I think uh, there is uh, too much concern about that. And also, if you look at the U.S. policy, somehow it's driven by a few officials with some extreme ideas, yeah. the anti-China ideas. Uh, they are asking, advocating for the whole of government bridge against China, everything against China. Yeah. I think that creates a lot of, you know, like a mobilization of the U.S. society against China. That's very unfortunate. Okay, John, uh, there seems to be a strategy here in the United States uh, on the part of President Trump and this White House to blame China for everything that's going wrong in this country. I mean, President Trump was asked about the recent widespread evictions resulting from the coronavirus pandemic. This is what he had to say. Let's listen. And if you talk about pandemic, this is a pandemic. And they go to shelters. Number one, they're thrown out viciously. It's not their fault. It's China's fault. It's not anybody's fault. It's China's fault. What do you make of that, John? Well, uh, President Trump isn't always perfectly clear, uh, and I'm not going to try to read anyone's mind. But what we have heard communicated from the White House and from the president on other occasions is the sense that he felt he was deceived by uh, Mr. Xi when the coronavirus first broke out in Wuhan in the larger Hubei province, and there were reassurances that it was no real threat to the United States or to the larger world. And President Trump publicly congratulated Mr. Xi on what was being done early on. And then we find out that there's been significant concealment and a whole host of very deceptive practices on the part of Beijing. And I think that's now frayed the personal relationship between Mr. Trump and Mr. Xi to the point yeah. where but they're not speaking for right. weeks now. And we have this breaking into yeah. almost every single dimension of the diplomatic relationship in ways that are deteriorating rapidly and probably won't improve for a long time to come. I get your point there, John. But is President Trump blaming China for his own mishandling of the coronavirus pandemic in this country? Two thirds of Americans think that he's botched it. He's bungled it. Yeah, I think there's a larger debate, Anand, about whether or not he's mishandled it or whether governors have mishandled it. Again, as we've uh, spoken about this in the past, 50 percent of all COVID deaths in America are in the New York City metropolitan area. Yeah. Strip that out, and the U.S. is far lower on the world scale of COVID-related deaths. We're all learning as we go along, including China, including the European Union and the United States. I don't know that anyone has a definitive plan for how to work this successfully, maybe outside of Vietnam, Taiwan and South Korea. Mm -hmm. But I think we're all learning. So I don't think it's really wise for us to get into who's working, making this work and who's not. But the president does feel betrayed by Xi Jinping. I think he put enormous stakes in that relationship yeah. and he feels betrayed. OK, Victor, you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, let me add one point. Does anyone in Washington can claim to the world that China hide the fact that it locked down the whole city of Wuhan, a pop city of a population of 12 million people on January the 23rd? Does anyone in Washington really have the decency to declare to the world that China hid the fact that they locked down the whole province of Hubei province with a population of 60 million people? 
Now, if anyone felt betrayed, blame themselves. What China did was to take the heroic act of exercising maximum control to cut down the spread of coronavirus in Wuhan, in Hubei province, and throughout China. And what China did was for the whole world to see. And if anyone, including President Donald Trump, felt betrayed, blame his own incompetence and inability, and golfing, for example, at the time, hundreds or thousands of thousands of Americans, good, decent, dignified Americans, are dying. Wake up and save the America. God save America. Harlan, it was only a year ago that President Trump was talking about the great relationship that he has with President Xi Jinping. The two leaders met at the G20 summit, which uh, took place in Osaka in Japan. Uh, how did this relationship head south so quickly? First, let me say it's interesting to hear about Tanya Harding, about which most Americans will not know and the references to Donald Trump playing golf, which I agree was uh, not a smart thing to do. Look, President Xi promised President Obama that he was not going to militarize the small islets in the South and East China Seas. And he lied, period. And so that began the issue of mistrust. Yeah. Look, both sides have got real grievances. And what you've heard from Beijing, in many ways, is just a lot of hooey. Yeah. And from the United yeah. States, we're not better off, quite frankly, because we've got embarked on this tariff war. We need serious negotiations between the two countries. We do not want to have some kind of a conflict that could be avoidable. China has right. all the right to become a great economy, and it should be. And unfortunately, we are allowing uh, of opinion and domestic politics on both sides right. to interfere. And quite frankly, we are headed for a crisis that neither country wants and neither country right now is trying to avoid it okay. and a pox on both yeah. of us. Shindo, very quickly, I've got about 30 seconds left. Do you think that uh, the relationship will get better no matter who wins after the November election? Uh, it could be. Uh, in particular, if uh, there's a Biden presidency, probably things will get better. At least you can talk some sense into uh, Biden and his team. This, we need a rational dialogue between the two countries. Uh, uh, for example, South China Sea again. Many people say China betrayed the U.S. But remember, it's a President uh, Obama. Uh, you know, under that, there's uh, two thirds, uh, 60 percent of yeah. the U.S. air and naval force will be deployed in right. the South China Sea. So China has to respond in a sense. So I okay. think they need to talk. I totally agree with that. We need more engagement there. Okay, and that's where we are going to have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. And that's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.